this message today uh, entitled, What, Why, and How to Follow the Lamb. We spent a little bit of time last week talking about the remnant as those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, and today we're going to look into the reason for it, uh, what to do, and how to do it, so to speak. And, and this might come across a little different than, than you might imagine there, but that's, that is the goal. So we'll go ahead and start off with our first verse here. And the first verse is Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. I don't see it up on the screen yet, but go ahead and grab your Bibles, your analog Bibles, and uh, look that one up. It's Revelation 14, verse 7. And this is what the verse says. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. I want, to notice, I want you to notice something about that verse, an eternal gospel. Uh, it doesn't say the eternal gospel, it says an eternal gospel, and there's actually a very significant theological reason why it says an eternal gospel. Now we realize there's only one gospel, but there's something about the gospel that when it is applied to a particular time, when it's applied to a particular place, it takes on its own timely significance. And that's part of what this, is, this verse is saying here as it speaks of an eternal gospel uh, that is to be proclaimed to those who dwell on the earth. We go now to our next verse, it's actually part of verse 7 here. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. Still not seeing my slides up front here. I don't know for sure what we're missing, but um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, fear God and give him glory is the first thing that we're, we're shared with here. And, and I want you to notice something about this, fear God and give him glory. It is the what. It is the what that we are called to do. Thank you. Um, fear God and give him glory. And then we also have in this verse, we have a why. Because the hour of his judgment has come. And we also have a how. Worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. A very familiar passage to us. If you grew up. Seventh-day Adventist, you heard the first angel's message, and you heard the second angel's message, and you heard the third angel's message, but today I want us to hear it in a new way and from a different perspective, and so what we're going to do is we're going to enter into a tale of five women that helps us to understand this story. Our first woman uh, is probably very familiar to you. This is one of my favorite paintings of Jesus. This is a painting by, I believe, a Utah artist by the name of Liz Lemon Swindell. And Liz painted this picture and titled it, Why Weepest Thou? You see, as Mary leans into the tomb, she has this broken and crushed spirit about her, having no idea what is standing just a few feet behind her. And if you look carefully, and you may not be able to see it in the size of image that I have, but there is a, a look of pain in the eyes and the face of her son, Jesus, as he looks on to his mother's broken heart. This is the tale of the first woman, a, a woman who is feeling the brokenness and the loss of her own son, Jesus. She still doesn't know the rest of the story. She's just feeling the pain, and she's weeping. Our second woman. In the 19th century, stolen from her home in Africa, working the cotton fields in the southern United States. Not by choice not for pay. She's a slave. And as she gathers the cotton, puts it into her basket, 
her baby, Mary, on her back, begins to cry. And to soothe her child and to soothe herself, I imagine that this woman begins to write a song that will be a song known to us by its title, but not known to us by its author. And the words she sings to soothe her child and herself go like this. Oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you mourn. Oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you mourn. Pharaoh's army got drowned. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. She hears the crying of her child still and can't imagine what that little mind knows. But the mother knows. She knows the memories of her home that she has been taken from. She knows the loss and the pain and the suffering of slavery, and she knows that her child has been born into it too. And so she writes the next verse to go with this chorus, soothing her child and and, and, and dreading the future that her child faces in slavery. She says, if I could, I surely would stand on the rock where Moses stood. Pharaoh's army got drowned, oh Mary don't you weep. We don't know her name. We don't know when she wrote. But we have the song. We have the song. A tale of another woman. Aretha Franklin. Anybody ever heard of Aretha? If you haven't heard of Aretha, you, I don't know where you've been. Wow. The voice, the mother, soul music in this country. Aretha had an incredibly successful music career, and then she made a decision that that terrified her producers. She came to them one day after after incredible hits and success and and gold records, and, and she came to her producers and she said, I want to do a gospel album. And her producer said, uh, gospel albums don't sell, Aretha. <laughs> she goes, well, I'm not doing it for you to make a lot of money. I'm not even doing it for me to make a lot of money. I am doing it for God. See, Aretha, despite all of her amazing talent and her amazing success, had found herself a slave to alcoholism. And she knew that, that despite the success, despite the wealth, d- despite everything that had been going on so well in her life, she knew that there was only one thing that would set her free from the slavery to alcoholism that she was experiencing. And that was the Lord Jesus. And she wanted to produce as a gift to Christ her gospel album of Aretha Franklin. Producers shook their heads. <laughs> what do you do? It's Aretha. <laughs> you do the record. You, you do the recording. You, you make her happy. Had no idea that those songs, too, would be hits. And those songs, too, would be bestsellers but for a whole different reason and for a whole different kingdom. And guess what one of the songs Aretha sang was. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. Don't weep. I can imagine that Aretha may have, as she sang the song, she may have thought of this verse as one that specifically spoke to her as she was enslaved by the chains of addiction, singing, Mary wore three links of chain. Every link was Jesus' name. Pharaoh's army got drowned. Oh, Mary, Don't you weep. See, Aretha knew her own bondage. She knew that the chains of addiction were holding her down. But oh, to wear three links of chain that are Jesus' name. There. Chains like that 
one finds freedom. Woman number four, her name is Katrina. You may recognize her. I think you've probably seen her before. Katrina, Hurricane Katrina. When I was a kid, they always named hurricanes after women. Somewhere along the line, women decided that was enough. They started naming them after men, and one of the hurricanes quite early on of naming hurricanes after men was Hurricane Barry. Nobody remembers Hurricane Barry, but everybody remembers Katrina. Everybody remembers Katrina because when Katrina hit the city of New Orleans, the dikes protecting the city, levees that were in place broke and water flooded the city. The city was in need of encouragement. The city was in need of rebuilding. The city was in need of hope. And so New Orleans had a jazz festival because that's what New Orleans does when New Orleans wants to find hope. And one of the people that they invited not exactly historically known as a jazz musician, but he had just put together a band. And one of their songs was a jazz funeral piece, something New Orleans is quite fond of. Anybody ever experienced a jazz funeral? Only on TV. <laughs> Only on TV. A jazz funeral is one of the most remarkable things. As I look at it from a pastor's perspective, one of the remarkable things about a jazz funeral is that, that you have this procession going down the street, casket and all, with people weeping and mourning and wailing the loss of the person who has died, and they reach a certain part in the procession. I don't know exactly how it works, but they get to a certain place on the street, and suddenly they go from mourning to celebration. And this musician and his sessions band took a song, a song written in the cotton fields years before, and they made it a jazz funeral. His name, Bruce Springsteen, unlikely character to be doing jazz funeral music. But to the city of New Orleans after Katrina and after the devastation and after the pain and the brokenness and the bondage they were experiencing, Bruce sang this line. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water. But fire next time. Pharaoh's army got drowned. It. Oh, Mary... Don't you weep. And you take a verse like that and you think about what it's actually saying and you wonder to yourself, is that hope? <laughs> God gave Noah a rainbow sign. No more water but fire next time. And you can search the story of the flood and you can say, I get the rainbow part, but where's the fire? And you have to go to Peter for that. Because Peter takes the story of the flood and he pulls it together with the story of the cross and the story of justice and the story of judgment. And Peter tells us this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, Peter tells us. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Have you heard the scoffers? It's a message you hear today. Take your Christianity and you can just take your Christianity and go. Things are continuing on as they always have been and Christianity hasn't made any kind of a difference. Where is this promise of his coming? Where is the promise of the solution and the answers to our world? Ever since our fathers slept, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, if there was a creation. Peter says this. There's a problem. 
They deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same heavens, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist, Peter tells us, are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. That's where that young lady in slavery in the cotton field got her line. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water, but fire next time. Not exactly everlasting or eternal gospel, is it? Not, not exactly everlasting good news. You're talking fire now, preacher. I'll spare the brimstone. How about that? Fortunately, within this context, we now move from Peter to Jesus. John the baptizer goes to the River Jordan, and John is in the River Jordan preaching. And he's offering a baptism. In fact, this is what he says to his audience. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Some translations say to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We'd like John to stop right there. Sounds kind of nice, actually. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of fire. But John isn't done yet. As he looks at the brood of vipers before him, he says, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. There's fire again. I would note that there's something significant going on here in this verse. And if you grew up farming or around farmers, you might get it. What relationship does wheat and chaff have with one another? The chaff comes off of the wheat. The chaff is what clings to the wheat and prevents it from being a meal. And the threshing process is there to break the chaff from the wheat. I, I pastored in Montana for a few years, and I visited a lot of farms. And I'm not a farmer, I'm not the son of a farmer, but I watched my farmer friends as they harvested their wheat crops with modern implements. And out there in the Great Falls wind of Great Falls, Montana, you would see the chaff blowing across the prairie as the fresh kernels of wheat were poured into a great big truck driving alongside the combine. The chaff isn't something separate from the wheat. It's a part of the weed. It's, it's, it's not this, these evil people and the good people. It's, it's evil people being rid of what makes them worthless and becoming worth something. The chaff might just be our sin. It might just be our brokenness that Christ comes in and separates away from us so that we are precious wheat and he burns that which separates us from him. This verse says something different than say a verse about the wheat and the tares. Some of those things which are also true. What's fascinating is John no sooner finishes this message of a warning or a gathering than Jesus shows up. John preaching very much like Peter. John sharing a message of warning that needs to be heard. 
But then Jesus shows up. I love this verse. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill, help me finish it, all righteousness. What in the world is Jesus talking about? How is a righteous man being baptized for the repentance of sins? How is that fulfilling all righteousness? But that's what Jesus says. Matthew goes on to tell us, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. I want you to notice something. John says, I baptize you with water, but after me comes one who will baptize you with what? And the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit and with fire. And Jesus is baptized with water. And what shows up? Holy Spirit. And if he's been baptized with water and Holy Spirit now shows up, what should we expect next? Fire. And sure enough, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by who? The devil. Baptized by water, baptized by the Spirit, and now about to be baptized by fire. And the fascinating thing that's happening here in the book of Matthew when this happens is Jesus is not only going through the steps that every sinner must go through, even though he's not a sinner. Jesus is going through the steps that Israel should have gone through but failed to do well. Jesus is going through the water. Jesus is led by the Spirit. And Jesus is now in the wilderness. Israel crosses the Red Sea, allegedly led by the Spirit, into the wilderness. Jesus is going where Israel failed to go because he's going faithfully. He's going following the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. He's doing the exodus better. And so it shouldn't surprise us that before all of this in Matthew 3 and Matthew 4, Matthew tells us this about Jesus when he was a baby and he and his parents went to Egypt. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Out of Egypt. Jesus is the new Moses, leading his people on the new exodus from slavery to freedom. And that's what I call an eternal gospel. That's what I call a message for the ages, a a message of deliverance that delivers all those who never found freedom. From Mary weeping for her child to a woman in the bondage of slavery writing a song to a woman, woman in the bondage of alcoholism trying to find freedom through her music. From people who experienced a hurricane called Katrina and were told that the rainbow was a reminder that there will be no more destruction by floods when it comes to destroying all flesh, but fire next time. We find ourselves encountering good news, eternal good news, specifically for our time, specifically for our place. And here... Again, is our verse. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, every nation and tribe and language and people. An eternal gospel. 
Not an eternal gospel for some, but an eternal gospel for all who have ever experienced slavery and injustice in whatever form it has enslaved humanity. Every nation, every tribe, every language, every people, everyone. Together. Everyone together in Christ. Everyone passing through the water that Jesus passed through in water baptism. Everyone receiving the Holy Spirit in Christ as Christ received the Holy Spirit. Everyone stepping into the wilderness of trial and tribulation and testing time of trouble, everyone following the Lamb wherever He goes. And where does He go? He goes through the water to fulfill all righteousness. He receives the Spirit. He follows the Spirit in the most detestable and lonely and broken places. And everywhere he goes, he brings healing. Through the testing in the wilderness, to the tempting of the devil, he comes forth victorious. And so do you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it's our desire to follow the lamb wherever he goes. We'd like to think that he leads on easy paths, but he leads out of Egypt. He leads out of slavery and out of Egypt, and out of slavery means through the waters. When we go through the waters, you are with us. He follows the Spirit, and we follow the Spirit into the wilderness, and we are into the wilderness to the cross, and we go to the cross. Father, we are reminded that we are called to finish the race set out for us, following our leader, the author, perfecter, and finisher of our race and of our faith. May we be by your grace those who follow the Lamb by faith wherever he goes, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.